welcome to welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Today we are going to consider the book Outer Course by Mary Daly, and it's going to be discussed by Marie Long and me, Joe Brew, uh, mostly by Marie. Um, so there is a chat you can participate in and do put questions in the Q and A. Um, so I'm just going to start off by showing you a picture of Mary Daly um, in 1987, which is around the time when Outer Course was written. So thank you so much, Marie, for being here. And um, over to you for uh, introducing the book and talking about it. Okay. Well, I wanted to start um, with an image that uh, kept coming to my mind as I read the book. And it's from an old play. Uh, in the play, the name of the play is The Search for Signs of Intelligent Life in the Universe. Um, and it, it was written by uh, Jane Wagner and played by Lily Tomlin. And the, the play is about uh, Trudy, who is explaining, Trudy, a Western woman, Western world woman, uh, who's explaining the world to a visitor from outer space and there's one um, scene in it that I, I that I that struck me and, and it's a scene where she holds up a can of soup in one hand and in the other hand she holds up a pitcher of a can of soup and she says soup art soup art to me, that says a lot about daily. This is nourishment on one hand. On the other hand, we have imitation, and that's patriarchy. Mary Daly is, is getting down to the nourishment. She's seeking reality. And if there's one word for me that, um, that really brings out that Mary Daly deals with, it, it's reality. She seeks reality um, through the, a lot of muck of patriarchy. She digs deep. Uh, she considers she talks herself. She talks about herself as a pirate, a voyager, and sublim on the subliminal sea. And um, so, she, and she so she brings us that back the truth, uh, the unvarnished truth about really is what ha what's happening to women. Um, over the ages, um, so let's let's jump right into it. Uh, the actual section she's divided outer course into four sections um, according to time, and uh, the first section is um, goes between zero and 1970. But the introduction, I wanted to say a few words about the introduction. To outer course, she talks about the foreground and the background, and throughout her book. And the foreground is basically male-centered, fabricated, elementary, and that's as opposed to elemental. Um, elemental is the, is the world of of women and re and and animals in Earth. So the foreground is male-centered. The background is the, she calls the realm of wild reality, homeland of women's selves and of plants, planets, stars, and animals. She says that outer course is a voyage of spiraling paths, moving out from the state of bondage. It's a continual expansion of thinking, imagining, acting, and being. She says that voyagers on the subliminal sea meet many blocks along the way. And we'll see in this um, autobiography how, how many blocks she met. Um, and so we require exorcism, exorcism of patriarchally inflicted aphasia, amnesia, and apraxia. And she defines aphasia as the inability to name background reality as well as foreground fabrications in the connections uh, among these amnesias inflicted by religion and theologies like psychology 
um, which serve to legitimate the androcratic lies. And apraxia is the inability to act inflicted on women. She says that we need to retrieve knowledge which has been lost. And the capacity for being in the present, the background present, in other words, being in the present, but with the knowledge of the background, is the core requirement of outer course. So in the first viral galaxy, which goes up to 1970, um, we'll, I'll, I want to start with, I'll tell you, she, she was born on April, uh, October 16th, 1928. Uh, that's one year before the uh, stock market crashed in the beginning of the Great Depression, uh, which had a huge influence on, on her and everyone else at the time. Um, so she's born into an Irish Catholic working class family. Uh, they lost their house during the Depression. Uh, and there were a number, there were suicides in the neighborhood, uh, which many people during the Depression, I think, experienced. Uh, uh, my, my mother did. Um, so she says, the problem of patriarchy is systemic. Patriarchy is a necrophilic form of society in which every legitimated institution is entirely in the hands of males and a few selected henchwomen. That is a society characterized by oppression, repression, depression, and cruelty. She says, there are and will be those who think I have gone overboard. Let them rest assured that this assessment is correct probably beyond their wildest imagination, and I will continue to do so. I wanted to mention, uh, when she was in second grade, um, her, there was a popular hymn, apparently, in the Catholic Church, and may, it may, may still be, it's by the name of Daily, Daily, Sing to Mary, and that's D-A-I-L-Y. And her second grade teacher used to write that on her on her little papers and cross it out. Um, is a sort of it, it is a dig really. Uh, and and that same teacher made fun of a very poor kid in the class, which shocked Mary Daly. So we see at that very early age, um, the second grade, at about seven years old, uh, it shocked her. You know, so she was paying attention and she also had a great deal of empathy for others. She said that she said that she was a gang leader. Uh, she fought irrationality from the beginning, from the get go. Her mother discouraged her from housework, said that her work was to go to school and study. Uh, she was a tomboy. In school, she loved science and math. She was boisterous. And, and, and this, this quote is, uh, I, she said, the rules of grammar and math constantly needed to be repeated for the boys. And an advantage for her, aside from the, nor the advantage of you know, having grammar and math down, she said, I was now basically equipped to see through all the myths of male intellectual superiority forever. Uh, she went to a small working class Catholic high school. Um, she had no desire for marriage, but she had a self, uh, from early on, a self confidence and a sense of direction, uh, which she attributes to her mother. Uh, she said, she said in high school, she couldn't understand the phenomenon of cheering for boys. And, um, she gave the Val Victory Address in 1946. She said in that, that time, she was inspired by two teachers uh, at the school. And she said she at that time, she wanted to, she says, I wanted to throw my life as far as it would go. And she was a very motivated, very motivated woman. Um, she has a, a, an experience, the clover blossom experience. This is where nature begins to come into her life, um, in which in the clover blossom gave her an intuition of being, she said, and also pushed her along in her quest to be a philosopher. 
So she wanted that from the very beginning, from very early on. She got a scholarship to the College of St. Rose, but couldn't major in philosophy. Uh, no philosophy was a required minor. And she says the, at the College of St. Rose, it demonstrated for her that women could be professors. And um, however, that the priests taught all the philosophy and religion courses with abominable incompetence. Uh, so, so she, uh, since no philosophy major was available, she became an English major. Um, and but took, uh, well, she took always took a lot of philosophy, as many philosophy courses as she should, she could get. And she says she felt her her survival was dependent upon climbing the academic uh, ladder, uh, and the, the fact that she didn't have money and she didn't have connections, so. That made a, a difference as far as her career goes uh, and her career choices. So, and she went to the Catholic University of America, which offered her a full scholarship, uh, but she had to take the MA in English to be consistent with her BA. Uh, she taught sixth grade, uh, and she said she experienced uh, stage fright teaching uh, sixth grade, uh, but that it was here that she developed powerful and unorthodox teaching skills. Uh, she had no ambition to teach, uh, to study or teach theology. However, she came across an ad for a PhD in religion for women uh, from St. Mary's College at Notre Dame in Indiana. And she was offered a scholarship and also a teaching job. Um, so she took it, you know, again, we, we, she, she, she needed to get ahead. Um, she said that, uh, speaking of Thomas Aquinas, which had a, who had a huge influence on her, she said that Thomas Aquinas was 90% philosophy and that through medieval theology, she learned to use her mind in a systemic way. Um, but here again, you know, she, she takes what she needs from people because Aquinas, she said Aquinas thought women were defective and misbegotten. Nevertheless, she learned from them. Um, she applied to Notre Dame for a doctorate in philosophy, was turned down because she was a woman. Uh, she sought teaching jobs. She had uh, 24 rejections, um, but was accepted by uh, as a teacher at Cardinal Cushing College. At the same time, she took courses in philosophy at Boston College. Uh, she said it was a grim time. <laughs> the mid to late 50s in the mind poisons in America. Um, she said she needed a better doctorate, though. Um, and that's we're talking job wise. Um, so but the only pontifical philosophy and faculty in the United States um, it was the Catholic University of America, and they ignored her request to study uh, philosophy, in spite of the fact that she studied Latin, Greek, Hebrew, German, and French, uh, and had more than an MA in philosophy. Anyhow, so she moves along and, um, you know, many, many blocks along the way, but she, she moves ahead. She got a loan um, to, uh, to become a, a, a faculty member at the University of Freiburg in Switzerland. Uh, and she said that the, after the deadly alienation of America, arriving in Europe was like coming home. Uh, and she taught there, uh, she taught uh, theology and philosophy to young American women from the, uh, on their junior year abroad program. At the same time, uh, she was taking her own studies, but uh, she said at the same time, she took 18 hours a week. Uh, in her own studies, which were taught in Latin. Um, she said that the faculty there held her American PhD in religion in contempt. So she had to jump through more hoops uh, to get uh, what, she, what she wanted. And so she had to start with a BA again in, in sacred theology and then work up to her PhD. Um, she said that her fellow students held women in philosophy in contempt but nevertheless, at one point, they applauded her. Uh, she got more money in a, uh, in a third job. 
Um, she went on vacation skiing with her students. Um, she said in short that she had come from a place of derivatives, fakes, and phony everything to its sources. And she toured England and Ireland. Uh, and she said that in her third year, she was earning enough money to bring her mom over. Uh, and she, uh, she graduated summa cum laude. Um, and then, then she, she said she had many hours in philosophy and she wanted to formal status and she got her doctorate then in philosophy. And she toured, uh, Greece, um, she said there were attempts to undermine her by professors. And she talks about the nastiness of the priests, um, but allowing that some, some were helpful. Um, anyway, she had to get out of Freiburg when she finished her studies. Uh, that, that was the, uh, that was the deal. So, uh, she didn't like leaving. She loved Switzerland. She loved Europe. But she signed a two year contract and as assistant professor in, uh, the theology department at Boston College. And uh, she said in, in, in retrospect that she felt she was very naive to do that because that she had so many hours already in, um, in philosophy and theology that she should have held out for at least an associate uh, professorship. She said virtually all her uh, students were males at first, uh, but uh, she liked her students. She liked teaching males as well. Uh, there's a lot of uh, debate about that, you know, that she, she got, I, well, anyway, she, she enjoyed teaching. Uh, she finished the church in the, church in the second uh, sex in September of 67. And uh, then problems uh, started arising uh, with the uh, uh, administration in Boston College. Uh, she gave a talk at Holy Names in, in, in Oakland, and they were angry at her for exposing the Catholic Church. Um, she said that there was an incident, and she has a number of these incidents, uh, of going with friends to a Catholic service. And she said she just couldn't take anymore. Uh, she said, just as I stood up and strode alone down the long aisle to the exit, the organ began to play. Unbelievably, the hymn that resounded through the church as I departed was daily, daily sing to Mary, <laughs> uh, which her teacher had written on her papers. papers. Um, in the spring of 68, oh, she had this, I, I don't think I have time to discuss this, but I, I, I recommend looking it up. She went to a Taekwondo demonstration, and, and that was pretty neat. Um, and she also got... Um, she got a one-year notice from Boston College. This was after church in the second sex. Uh, they did not like that at all. Uh, but there were demonstrations and uh, massive demonstrations about this. And, and she ended up getting a promotion in tenure. She said that her, her apartment became a, a center of radical thought. Um, now we move on to the second spiral galaxy. Uh, and this takes place between uh, 1971 and 1974. Uh, she, she defines original sin as women's internalization of blame and guilt, the result of enforced complicity in our own oppression. Um, she mentions... Uh, the Sacred Canopy, a book by a sociologist. She said it was a lucid book, though he refused to acknowledge its logical implications. And, and this was, this happened to Daly a lot, I think. You know, this is one of the things that she finds in patriarchy and patriarchal um, ac academics. Um, she says this incident was a, and she, she corresponded with him and he really didn't acknowledge her at all. She says this instant incident was a source of inspiration. One message that I received was that patriarchal theorists could know exactly what their society was doing to women while at the same time refusing to know this. 
to me, this implied an aggressive will not to know, which I think is huge. And I think we have the same throughout time, the same problem. Uh, so she said, so any remnants of my naive belief that the problem in patriarchy was lack of information and that rational explanation education was an adequate solution were blown away. This was huge in second wave, I think. Um, you know, we, we tried to, you know, we thought that if we just explained uh, things, you know, I mean, like, why women should get equal pay for doing the same damn job as a man, you know, if we just explain why, how wrong that was, that people, you know, would understand and be on our side, but that's not the question. This is an aggressive will not to know. Um, she talks about the courage to see, which is huge. She says that seeing means everything changes. You can't go home again. Um, in the academic year 71 to 72, she taught her first feminist classes, and her students were J Jan Raymond, who came over from Andover Newton, uh, Linda Barafaldi, Emily Culpepper, and Jean McRae. Uh, the last three were from Harvard Divinity. <clears throat> and those, those, that group of women bonded and became what's known as the Tigers. Um, she talks about <clears throat> the Harvard Memorial Exodus. Uh, she was invited to be the first woman to preach at a Sunday service in the church's 336-year history. And the question was to accept or to refuse. Um, but she accepted. And she said, but she said at the end of her uh, talk, sermon, she said at the end, let us affirm our faith in ourselves and our will to transcendence by rising and walking out together. And hundreds of women and some men left the service. She spoke at the World Fem Conference in Prostitution in December 71. Um, Oh, she says, she explained that St. Saint, Saint Augustine and Thomas Aquinas had reluctantly affirmed the expediency of prostitution, justifying this by comparing prostitutes to the sewers of the city. Uh, in uh, she's 71, 72 were good years for her. Um, but she said, she says, she, she, she read a coming out piece. This is coming out as a lesbian. She read a coming out piece in Notes from the Third Year, Women's Liberation, a collection of articles by radical feminists published in 1971. She said, my friend and I read this piece together and soon sprang into action. <laughs> and from that moment, nothing was ever the same again. She said, enormous forces were unleashed by the discovery of another dimension of, of my identity. In 72, she signed a contract for the Beyond God the Father. Um, she presented a, the, what's called the Lentz Lecture at Harvard Divinity called The Most Unholy Trinity, Rape, Genocide, and War. Uh, so she kept on um, speaking, and you can imagine how the, uh, how the priests back at uh, Boston College took that. Um, and then there was a companion moment uh, she talks about, too. Uh, she says something. She says, sailing through the mist, which contains background knowledge, as well as man-made pollutants. And she talks about her cove on, uh, in, in Brighton. She says it was the gathering place where they had communal movements of breaking through the mist of the subliminal sea. And she says the tigers played a lot, too. They had a mascot. A beanbag, frog beanbag mascot. Um, she said, so she, she went, so she was constantly um, derided by her, um, by the administration at Boston College. So she, she went through a whole lot with every, with every, everything she did, all her lectures. 
And what, but what she says is what, what I was living through was linked to the experiences of women who have struggled to save themselves when patronized, battered, and or raped by predatory pops, pimps, or husbands, or when undermined by sickening physicians, pompous priests, jockocratic judges, or bullying bosses, or when simply drained by droning clones or sapped by sneering snools in the street. And in here she is, her fair, her famous quote, which I actually just heard yesterday. Uh, recognizing that I would be punished just as much for being an itty bitty feminist as for going the whole way I decided to go the whole way. Now we're at, um, on the third spiral galaxy. And that takes place between 1975 and 1987. So she, um, she said that by 1975, fragmentation was already setting in and threatening the newly recalled integrity of feminists and our expanding network by means of the thought-stopping, action-stopping machinations of their media, their educational institutions, their religions, their politics, inducing apraxia, or the inability to act as radical feminists. She basically defines fragmentation as the stunting and confining of elemental growth, movement, and creativity by mandatory subservience. She said that it's time to overcome man-made illusions of the foreground, time for spinning. And spinning, she basically defines as the discovering the lost thread of connectedness within the cosmos and repairing this thread in the process. She says, as an offensive, tasteless, haggard, pirate, I was inspired to acquire the courage to leave the doldrums of stagnation, sailing off with as much loot as my craft could carry. I tried to foster in myself and others the courage to live wildly, that is to refuse inclusion in the state of the living dead, to break out from the molds of archetypal dead time, to take leap after leap of living faith, becoming fiercely biophilic. Um, she didn't, she believed that justice is not possible under patriarchy. We need righteous fury. We need the virtue of disgust, revulsion, and, and we need the virtue of laughing out loud. Uh, she was invited to deliver a paper at the Second International Supposedly Mondelez, uh, in which she wore uh, her cords and boots. Uh, in which she called her terrifying tiger t-shirt. And the, the title of that speech was Radical Feminism, the Qualitative Leap Beyond Patriarchal Religion. Uh, she, de said she debated delivering the speech, but once again, she said that she discovered a third option, spiraling between the twin perils of tokenism and assimilation on one hand and self-erasure and elimination on the other hand. She concludes that women and men at this point in history cannot simply get together and work it out. Um, feminists were being purged from academia. Uh, she was denied full professorship. Uh, she said that uh, Jan Raymond was denied even an interview for a faculty position at that time because the department would be out of balance if two people were approaching things from a feminist anti-Christian perspective. Of course, they didn't uh, like the priests didn't like that. Kind of. um, but there were promotion. There were protests regarding her non-promotion, and that there was in there was an event in the Foreign Forum of, on Women in Higher Education at Boston College where there were eight hundred women. Her friends dressed up as foremothers: uh, Gertrude Stein, Elizabeth Oak Smith, and Susan B. Anthony, and they gossiped together on stage while the audience eavesdropped. And Robin Morgan was the moderator there. And she says, between, because uh, since Beyond God the Father had been super scholarly and yet had been called unscholarly by the cynical, deceptive fathers of reversal, I was now liberated into the possibility of qualitatively other daring deeds. So she just, you know, that backlash actually acted, you know, to the propulsion. Um, 
she dreamed of a feminist university. Uh, and there was this uh, called Sagaris, which is a feminist summer school, and she taught there, uh, and others did, but it was short lived. Uh, and she received an unpaid uh, absence from Boston College to write gynecology. And she said about that, she said the ecstatic connectedness with Denise made the explosion of creativity that brought forth gynecology. She said that the writing flowed and sparkled. Uh, and she, she took voluminous notes on all sorts of subjects um, and then wrote, it took three years to write gynecology. Uh, she felt herself to be in a special mode of creative consciousness. Um, oh, starting at the beginning of 1977, Bailey began declaring her lesbian identity. But she didn't think that that was the most radical thing that she, she that she'd ever done. But that, but she, but she didn't. Uh, and Andre Collard was a big influence on Mary Dean, and then I imagine vice versa. Uh, in their belief in interspecies communication, and she tells stories of Andre's dog, her a hermit crab, a particular cow in the Alps, um, and you can read about that. I, I find that uh, interesting. Uh, she mentioned the absurd idea that animals have no sense of humor. Um, she went with Denise to Crete. She was imp impressed at the, by the uh, Palace of Nosos and the paintings on the walls of blue dolphins at the Heracleian, I'm not sure about the pronunciation, a museum, which for daily represented the lost thread of connectedness with the cosmos, specifically between women and animals and the elements. It was an inspiration for spinning away from patriarchal and necrophilic system that negates such connections. Always connections. She's making connections. Um, this is a patriarchal necrophilic system which destroys women and nature. Uh, she interpreted the paintings as messages of hope swimming to us from the past. Um, in gynecology, she named connections among foreground phenomena that were masked, exposed the atrocities against women under patriarchy on a planetary scale, which she described as an agonizing process. Uh, she, she talks about the Sado ritual syndrome, and I don't think I've got time to read that, but I, um, there's one item I wanted to mention because it struck me as, uh, Part of the Sado risk, uh, ritual syndrome was written um, since gynecology was written. The agents of patriarchal evil have invaded women in nature with more and more virulent attacks. And and item number six says one, one of the things that patriarchy, one of the tricks of patriarchy, is the, re, the readjustment of consciousness. So that previously unacceptable behavior becomes accepted, acceptable, and even normative. And you know, of course, we see that big time today. Um, gynecology began to appear uh, in the bookstores in December 78. Um, and then the invasion took place of her classroom. Uh, there were, um, her phone call, for one thing, her phone calls were blocked. Um, they said that, you know, she wasn't there anymore when they, if someone called her. Um, she said that pre each previous attack followed the publication of a new book. It, in June 79, she said there were three visitors, in other words, uh, uh, from the uh, administration. And, you know, joining her class for, for no reason other than to uh, give her a bad time, really. Uh, and she says then, she said, I never refuse to teach bona fide, registered, qualified male students. And she says, the administration at Boston College had neither the courage nor the wit nor the scholarship to refute my ideas. Therefore, they must resort to lies and petty harassment. But she says, persecution at Boston College functioned as a laboratory and microcosm enabling you to understand even more deeply not only the banal mechanism of phallocratic evil, but also the possibility of transcendence, 
But she says that it was all exhausting, which, which it must have been. I don't know how she how she persevered through all this. Other, here again, the administration withheld her annual salary increase. Um, however, then there was an event at Morris Auditorium at Boston University in which a thousand women were present in support of her. And the speakers there included Jan Raymond, Adrian Rich, and Andre Collard. She did a tour of the United States of uh, gynecology. She lectured, her last lecture on that was at uh, Berkeley. Uh, we're talking 70, 79, uh, 80. Um, she said she spoke in an auditorium in a science building at Berkeley. And she says that knowing that animal experimentation, that is torture of animals, was practiced there as in other, quotes, educational institutions, I was inspired to get it, dedicate that lecture to my friend, Andre Collard, who was then doing research for her book, Rape of the Wild, and who was passionately devoted to exposing patriarchal destruction of nature and particularly of animals, and thus the gyne ecological connection, the elemental connection between radical feminism and ecology was explosively made there. Um, we move into the 80s and the Reagan years, increasing conservatism and decadence. Um, where she says that rad femmes struggled to stand their ground against the gathering storms of backlash. Um, but the challenge was to become ever more fiercely focused, more wild and daring. Our sister of the earth was in mortal danger. Um, then she started pure lust um, in, the, in the Newtonville house. Where she says we're wild cat and wild eyes. That's uh, Mary's and Denise's cats, respectively. Where they ruled happily. Um, she there was a cabin in the hills, and she hiked and anything in the hills, and that was her her, her sustenance, her renewal from all the crap that she went through uh, in, uh, from Boston College and and elsewhere. Um, she says that the essential task of, ele of the elemental feminist philosopher is learning to trust one's own judgment, one's deep power of discernment, and to communicate such knowledge and act. Uh, she says that in the summer, spring and summer of 81, my soul was in wasteland. In 81, in July 81, she went to Australia and uh, a woman drove her to the airport and told her that uh, women are threatened by her brain. It's just pretty sad. Um, Mary understood the total taboo against women becoming women, woman identified, self identified philosophers. More, far more difficult than becoming the theologians, even. Uh, she traveled in Australia. Uh, she had one one engagement where they said Yankee go home, but she had friends there too, and she loved Australia. She loved the she loved all the animals, the wild parrots, kangaroos, kookaburras, great, uh, great barrier reef, and the mountains. And she said once again she was in touch with the powers of the elements. So that was her renewal. Um, she went, she spoke at the University of Wisconsin in February 82. Um, she felt that it was success, a uh, success. However, there was a reporter there who did not like her lecture. And, and this got back to Boston College, which they used uh, as ammunition once again against her. Uh, and she called this the, she called it the Inquisition and, and distortions of her speech. Uh, but from the Inquisition, I actively wrenched concepts I included in pure lust. The more and more knowledge about the father's foreground and the elementary world as opposed to elemental. The elementary inquisitors have only nothing to offer, exposing their nothingness. And she toured in Switzerland and Austria. She met Heidi uh, Abedroff in that time. Um, 
there was uh, formaldehyde they found in the installation of their house, and it was too expensive to remove. Yeah. Um, she said, Elemental uh, Feminist Philosophy, she debated that title. She wanted to discuss not only uh, patriarchal evil, but also the patriarchal corrosion of women's bodies, minds, and souls. Female self-hatred and horizontal violence addressed in Beyond God the Father in gynecology. Um, she said the, cha the challenge of pure lust is to spin and live moments of ecstasy, for ecstasy is taboo in patriarchy. And she, she, was, she spoke in England, in, in uh, London, I guess, um, and there were promoters of um, anti-rad films, and they, they actually banged on her uh, hotel room uh, door uh, she said there was a growing hostility in the far foreground. Um, but at the same time, she felt that there was a resurging from the background of belonging, befriending, and bewitching. She said, what I learned from the London event and have had, had to relearn repeatedly is the absolute importance of continuing to exercise the foreground demon and to recall background, consciousness, memories, images, which in these decades of decadence have been pushed back under the surface of the subliminal sea. The challenge is to continue, to continue realizing the elementary powers, el, sorry, elemental powers of women, elemental powers. Um, in Ireland, she loved, she loved Ireland. Um, and, um, she says that the, the, the Irish women, she, she went there for a book week and the Irish women were absolutely genuine. Um, and when she, when Bailey finished her talk, one woman got up from the audience and sang her a song. Um, you know, how, how nice is that? How often does that happen? Uh, and one woman there asked her why she stayed at BC, at, at Boston College, which, you know, we, we wonder. She said, from the depths I answered, I choose to stand my ground. And this surprised her. And she was applauded loudly for that. Uh, the Irish women, I think, knew, knew the priests very well. So I don't think there were many surprises for them, for, for, for those that, uh, that, that like daily anyway, she 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 felt grief at leaving Ireland, her own people. She got letters, uh, a lot of letters, thanking her basically from women who were felt very isolated. Um, she said by 1984, the horrors of Sado society had become blatant beyond belief. And then she worked on Wicked Eric with uh, Jane Caputi, and I think she had a lot of fun doing that. Um, she said it was freeing words from the cages and prisons of patriarchal patterns. Um, and then we come into the um, Reagan years. Um, she said um, in 1985, inquisitorial uh, cross country tracking by, uh, uh, by Boston College was resumed. Um, Uh, she proposed a feminist lecture series called Witch, uh, Wild, Independent, Thinking Crones and Hags. Uh, in April, uh, where are we as far as time goes? Maybe I should apply. Uh, Ch Chernobyl happened in 86, and two months later, she, you know, she debated going to a lecture, to lecture it's, uh, in Oslo, but she went anyway. You know, the women were extremely depressed because you know, they, they didn't think they were going to live that long. In fact, one woman gave her some kind of an antique four, you know, and thinking, you know, she wouldn't be around much longer to enjoy it. And she says her return to the United States um, were the effects of Chernobyl were were not not really uh, publicized very much. She said just fluff in the United States. Uh, she said she, she pondered with disgust the systematic moronization 
of Americans by the media. Um, and, and, and finally, in, in that uh, galaxy, I used to say, she says, the history of women's struggles to provide and maintain diverse forms of women's space has been a vivid testimony to the fact that men recognize this to be a crucial issue in the war to control women's minds. Um, so, uh, I think she wouldn't be totally, totally surprised about what is happening today, but she would certainly be disgusted. Uh, we move on to the fourth spiral galaxy. And she starts out by saying, um, we need to keep going because they want us to stop. And she remembers her mom saying, go do your work here. Uh, she began working on Outer Force in the spring of 87 uh, after handing in uh, the manuscript of Wicked Airy to the publishers. Um, it seemed to her like two books wanted writing. She wanted to write an autobiography and she also wanted to um, write her, up her philosophy. So she combined, as she said it again, the transcendent, transcendent third option was our course, a logbook of a radical feminist philosopher. Um, I, I wanted to quote this that I thought was really interesting or fun. Uh, it's called Fed Up. Um, she says, I want to blast out of boredom every way, every day. That's so extreme, they say. It's high time to be extreme, I say. While we wade knee, knee deep in the blood of women, shall I chant about Freud, Derrida, and Foucault? No, I don't think so. Better to catch a comet by a tail and soar with it. Better to jump bail. The whole foreground is a jail. Gender studies, blender studies. No male bashing, they say. That's very bad, they say. Bad girl. Patriarchy is planetary, planetary, I howl. That's none of your business, they say. Their eyes are glazed, dazed. We are not feminists anyway. That's passe. We are not feminists anyway. That's passe. Unfortunately, the generation after mine, that was the, seemed to be the code of the generation after mine. I'm sorry to say. Um, can't you sense the pain of the foot maimed Chinese women hobbling on mutilated gangrenous stumps over hundreds and hundreds of years? I ask. It was a different culture, they say. Can't you feel the pain of 30 million genitally mutilated African women today? I ask. It's none of your business, they say. It's another culture, that girl. It's the same culture, I say. Can't you feel anything? They shrink away, their faces gray. As white privileged middle class women, we can't possibly imagine. Shut up, I say. You bore me, you gore me. You're killing me with your academic stupidity. Uh, we feel invalidated by your remarks, they say. Well, that's good, I say, finally. So that's Mary Bailey's take. And then she, she starts talking in the fourth, in the fourth spiral galaxy about the other side of the moon. And, um, I think so, so some, some will be turned off with that. I, ha I happen to love it. Uh, the other side of the moon with Catherine and Wildcat and, in her writing. Um, and she talks about lunar, lunar intermissions. And, and then she goes back and forth to her travels. Uh, if you're interested in some really neat stuff, I recommend reading her on her, on her trips, travels in Ireland. It's very interesting. Uh, her and a group of friends. Um, she said in Switzerland, my heart leapt when I saw the Alps up, up into ecstasy. It was a particular kind of ecstasy that I've never felt in America. Again, Daly assumed she would have full professorship, and now we're talking. Uh, in October 88, after 13 years, she applied again. And apparently, this is a long, grueling process, she said. Uh, and it was again declined. Uh, but the students 
petitioned in her behalf, as did colleagues, and wrote letters of support. And then the demonstrations really began. She said there were flyers, marching, chanting, spraying, um, huge. And she said about this, the effect of this action upon the demonstrators was stunning. They had begun a bewitching process. Musicians, powerful speakers, including Julia, Julia Penelope. Um, Daly said that the whistle had been blown on Boston College, nationally and internationally. Uh, and she felt that it led to an insurrection and a new surge of hope. She said, I had continually stressed with my students that since patriarchal scholarship and professions commonly present interrelated events as if they were not connected with each other, they should constantly attempt to see and name the connections. Um, and the crimes against women were escalating. Um, but here, this is um, she, this event, a patriarchy on trial, May 14th, 1989. Uh, they, uh, this is one of her great, great actions. When the, when there were the witches, the judges, and the jury. Uh, they made a list of the accused and made wo wooden dummies of them. Uh, they, they were, there was Larry Flint, figurehead for pornographers, Jack the Ripper, figurehead for serial killers, Exxon, figurehead for earth rapers of every kind, the more moronizing media, figurehead for dim witters of the world, Sigmund Freud, figurehead for all professional mindfuckers, Boss Town College, figurehead for the brain grainers in academia, his nothingness of Rome and his arrogance, Cardinal Flaw figureheads for the soul killers of women. And so it, it, the, the women there, so and they conjured the elements of earth, air, fire, and water. And also four sisters, uh, Joan of Arc, Harriet Tubman, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, Sojourner Truth, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, Virginia Woolf, and Andre Pollard. Um, they made, and they, uh, these women, they made large portraits. Um, and um, then there were the chair crones of the court. Who, they wore witches' hats and carried their labrises aloft. And the grand accusers were Gail Dines, Melissa Fletcher, uh, Joyce Contrusi, Julia Penelope, Bonnie Mann, Emily Culpepper, and Mary Bailey. Well, you can guess what the what the results were for there. Um, she talks about them. After that, the, the uh, massacre of women, the guys, I don't like the massacre in, in a month, you know, maybe then. Um, but she says, when when feminism seems to be down in one area, it may be rising furiously in another. Um, she said, yes, we need our workshops on the moon to gain peace and intergalactic perspective, but we must also continue frequently to act and fight and create on our respective boundaries on the home planet. We have come here so we can stand our ground there. If you have the other side of the moon in your head and in your heart, you can trust that the failure is impossible. And that's the fourth one. Let's see. And, uh, uh, here we are. Go ahead. Right. Um, Carry on. Um Thank you so much, Marie. That was absolutely wonderful. It's a great pleasure to be part of this and hear, hear you tell or sort of recap what's in our course. Um, there are a couple of questions that came up. Um, there's one in the Q&A and I'm going to read that to you. And then I've taken photos actually from the chat. So I'll read them out to you. A couple of sort of uh, clarifications or women interested in knowing your thoughts. So the Q&A question is from... Arialia, Ariala, Leela, Arialila. Um, any thoughts on what the spiral galaxy symbolized for Daly? Yeah, I, I, I've thought about that. No, I can only guess. I can only give you what I what I see. Um, you know, spiraling for her is moving ahead. You know, spiraling, moving, um, and she was so into action. Galaxy, she she relates to the, the the whole. You know, it's not just 
our world here on Earth. It, it's the whole universe kind of thing. Um, it, that's the best I can do as far as those spiral galaxies. I don't know if she yeah. she says herself. I think a thing I I mean I remember reading something, um, and I don't think it's an outer course, but I think it might be somewhere else that Mary Daly said that the which I thought was really useful about the idea of spirals that. In a spiral, you're going back again, but you're slightly different. You're sort of maybe moving upwards. And that if you look at moments that like on the line of the spiral where they join up, um, you might think they're not connected, like the patriarchal fragmenters say, oh, that's not connected to another yeah. because you see them as dots. But in the spiral, there is a connection. And I thought that's like that's really interesting, and yeah, interesting. that that those and her repeated discussion of uh, everything being connected and time, um, you know, that we are connected to the past and the future um, in a sort of repeated spiral. I, I that's I think I think that might be in one of her writings after this, after Out of Course. Um, okay. Anyway, right, I next like one. Yeah, I mean, that might add to it. Um, okay. So, uh, uh, Aria Leela says again, Ma Marie mentioned the book is organised around a spiral arm galaxy model, if I hear rightly. This reminds me of Always Coming Home by Ursula Le Guin, which imagines a female-centred world in the far future with a culture in which spiral arm images are important. So that's interesting. And then there's a question, or it's a clarification uh, from Sarah Bowen. I didn't understand the reference to clover blossom. Uh, <clears throat> well, I don't know if she, she fully explains it. it. You know, it, it's her incredible, it spoke to her. Uh, that That's part of her, you know, her I guess, sort of whimsical nature in a way. But I mean, she she was so grounded in nature, and so the clover blossom actually spoke to her, and gave her a sense of her own being. Uh, how to further interpret that, I don't know. That's it's philosophy beyond my ability. But uh, well, yeah, and I think I think that, and she mentions uh, Virginia Woolf. One of her key moments, you know, Virginia Woolf says that the uh, a flower. She sort of saw a flower um in the ground and realized it's the whole it's it's not just the flower or the plant or the ground it's everything together and that's a sort of um i suppose it's a sort of way of understanding the world as being together um and there's some yeah to do with nature and being very grounded there's some really good quotes in out of course about the importance of being grounded in reality which again are important for us today aren't they um, I'd just like to mention for me the the thing that one of the many things that you covered, Marie, so brilliantly, um, is this idea of the subliminal sea. That she says that even in times when uh women aren't conscious, um understanding, say feminist consciously understanding the patriarchy, there's this underneath the limon the the subliminal the under uh, like that we don't and she says it's not the subconscious that freud talks about she says it's uses it sort of says i'm not i'm just using this subliminal see as a different thing but um uh there's a lot of understanding in women about the patriarchy that she she says it's it's subliminal and i think she she for me um, she brings a lot of the time she brings that understanding that we as feminists we always wanting to do is to bring out sort of draw out understanding and help women see consciously uh, what the patriarchy is so that's a, a good thing I thought the, the idea right well we we'll always be aware of the background yeah We've come to the end um, of our hour. Um, so thank you so much, Marie. That was unbelievably brilliant. There's breakout thank rooms you. that we've put in the chat for anybody and um, either see you in the breakout rooms or see you next week. And thank you on behalf of everybody. There were nearly 100 women here today, Marie. So thank you so much. <laughs>